So uh, the idea in, in this video like this is to try to give you a bit of an overview of how to uh, do modeling, so theory, and simulation of reactive events. And I, I do think, is there, is there a point? So I, I unfortunately I could not attend the beginning of the the, the service group, so I have missed all of the lectures in the first two in particular. Uh, the one of uh, Nikolai Pavinello and then the one of uh, Larry Peters that, that I, I think introduced you already quite a bit about the problem of uh, these very reactive events. But as you probably know by now, uh, one of the major <coughs> one major issue that you have to face when you Is the fact that they are these uh, reactive events that tend to be rare. Okay, they are rare on the internal part of the system, meaning they are rare if you count the time the temperature changes. The time scale is a very rare event. It's very fast on your own time scale, so they are very important. And in fact, uh, as you know, there are many processes that are really very important that, that are precisely these very events, like uh, phase transition or conformation change in micromolecules, which is very important even, uh, or chemical reaction. Okay. And so what, what I want to do in, in these uh, few lectures is to try uh, to give you a perspective which is maybe slightly different from the one you, you have already on what these events are and uh, how you can describe them, and once you have the right kind of framework, how you can use that to do smart and more efficient calculations. And it, these events are rare, uh, essentially because what happens is that you have, and this is what we're going to try to precise, you know, make more precise now, is that uh, it, it is the phase space of the system, so, so the, the phase space over which the dynamics of the system evolve, It's effectively partitioned into regions that are separated by dynamical properties. Right? And so what happens is that the system is offering in one of these regions and it's trapped in there, but like if you play this room, and it has to find a keyhole to go into another room, and that takes a very long time. Okay. When it does that, uh, you, the rare events occur, and so you have, for example, a conformation change or a phase transition that occurs. And, and this phenomenon, Stay in one region for a long time for the system and then only going suddenly from region to region uh, is called metastability. And so I'd like to discuss a little bit what is the origin, the microscopic origin of metastability before going to how to describe it. So this is the standard picture uh, that you have in most chemistry books, and that's a uh, very efficient one actually, but, but also someone, something that can be misleading uh, is that of transition state theory, where the idea that you have is to say, well, these very events, uh, so, so this motion of the landscape and then this keyhole and the time of the they can be interpreted from just by looking at energy. You can think about the system as navigating over an energy landscape, particular one dimensional one in transition state theory, in which uh, you imagine that any reaction that go where the system needs to go from a reactant to a product can be described uh, by identifying a right reaction coordinate, which should in principle tell you something about the advancement of this reaction, and then an associated free energy such that you have a landscape that is double well, like that or triple well for if the case more intermediate, in which the system is hovering near the reactant state until a thermal fluctuation big enough allows it to hop over this barrier to a transition state where the, 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 there's a free energy barrier here and then going into the cooling state. Okay. And associated with this picture, there is the, the, the time scale uh, that, uh, result that you know, which is to say that uh, if the energy barrier that you need to cross is delta E, then the time scale of the event given by Arrhenius 
the scale that E to the beta delta E where beta is in those temperature in units of energy. The difficulty with this picture, of course, is that uh, you need to define what is the reaction cooling agent, which is by no means something which is simple if the system under consideration is complicated. So this is like the integration process, transformation chain, all that. It's not clear at all how you can actually look at the system in such a way that you can project it into one dimensional coordinate, which would make you know, this picture. And part of what we're going to do today is to try to understand how we can define these reaction coordinates more precisely. Now, they are, of course, simple systems that fits the framework of the <coughs> transition to theory quite well, even though even these simple systems uh, can lead to some confusion. So, I'll just put one here. So, uh, this is motion by over that Langevin equation. So if you imagine this is the equation that you would get uh, if you take the standard Langevin equation, which is everything in dynamics plus the thermal mass, and you all know what that is, in which but if you take the masses to be fairly big, so you take the high friction limit of the core, and in this case there is no inertia. Right? You instead of having Newton's dynamics, you end up having Aristotle's dynamics. Velocity is proportional to the force, so d, 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 t is the velocity, no. and the gradient of v minus the gradient of v is the, is the, is the force applied to the system, and uh, the v is the potential. Right? And in this description, I suppose you're all familiar with, the, with that, uh, that there is you account for thermal effects by including a term which is a white norm, and I've written it here in. In a, in a way which makes apparent the scaling. So eta there is a white noise, meaning that uh, if you look at it, it's a Gaussian process which has zero mean and which is such that if you take uh, its covariance, it's a delta. Okay? Like delta like that. And, and the scaling, right, I made it apparent by putting the, the Temperature here, right? Beta and all of that at this point. Right, so one thing before I, I go on. Since I was not there for most of the, the, the school, uh, not only I don't know what uh, really the other people have been talking about, but I actually don't really know what your background is. Okay? So don't hesitate to ask me and ask me questions if I'm talking about things that you have no idea about. Because otherwise you can go on and you will be talking about the right school that time. Okay? If you're not saying anything, I'm assuming that what I'm saying is clear. Right? You see that it's so clear that there's nothing to be said, and I hope that's not the case. If that's the case, there's a question. Okay, so, so here is the overdamp launch my equation, and here's a little example. A 2D example that illustrates what the beta stable phenomenon can be. So you take it, so what you see here is a contour plot, the, 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 this color is a contour plot of the potential. You are all familiar with this type of picture. It's a potential in which there is one minimum here, one minimum there, and a subtle point between. Okay. And so what happens is that, if, if you very, very uh, you know, quickly, what happens is uh, if the energy barrier that you have to cross go from this minimum to this minimum to the saddle point. So if the energy of the saddle point compared to, to the one of the minima is much higher than the thermal energy than KVT, which is there, then this is a small perturbation of the dynamics that only takes effect on long time scale. On short time scale, what happens is that the force dominates and it brings the system down towards the nearest minimum, and then it augurs there for a very, very long time until the fluctuation large enough finally occurs that managed to push the system over the hill, meaning through the separatrix between these two basin, in which case it can go on the other side. Okay? And this is a time series that of this system, the time series where the position here is the x position, and indeed there's a minimum at one and a minimum at minus one. And you see in, in 
B, offering over here, and then a transition offering again, a transition and so on and so forth. Okay? So this corresponds to oscillation like this, and then they go over there and so on and so forth. Right? And these are rare events. The time scale key is actually for this white block. Right? And uh, so this fits the standard. You can understand what's going on here just by looking at the energy. Uh, system tends to be the metastability is associated with this minima of the energy. Uh, the, the transition events occur because the system needs to cross this energy by it, which tends to occur with high probability by going to the southern point, because if you look at the ridge on this landscape, which is the, 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 the ridge that separates the basin of attraction of this minimum and the basin of attraction of this minimum, the southern point is the point on this ridge which has been of energy, so that's the one that is the least costly for the system to reach, the, the one that requires the smallest among these large Okay. And indeed, I mean, if you look at the uh, trajectory, so what you see here is the tail of a trajectory. So on this scale, right, what you see is I, 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 you, I was detecting when the trajectory reaches the, a neighborhood of this minimum for the first time after having reached a, a neighborhood of this minimum. Okay. So the first time it got there, I, I looked a little bit in the back and see what happened. And what happened was that the trajectory did something like this. On, on this scale, this whole trajectory would be essentially one vertical line which corresponds to the transition events, where the trajectory leaves this minimum and goes into this one. Okay. Of course, it does that. This is just one vertical line here. Right? What you don't see is this offering, which otherwise would make a big, enormous white patch there, which is not very useful, which is when the trajectory stays. Uh, the red curve that you see on the graph is the minimum energy path. Right? And one of the things that we will have to discuss later, I'm just asking you that already now, is that uh, if you want to map this into, I say this fits the TST picture, indeed it does. But the reaction coordinate that you need to use is not the minimum energy path. Because, you know, it's like the path. The reaction coordinate is something that allows you to do a projection into a one dimensional coordinate, which is not quite the same. Thing. So we have to discuss that later. But, but still, this is something that can be described by, by physicist theory, and we will find that out later. Okay. However, of course, this is very simplistic, right? If you you know if you think about uh, these beautiful pictures that you find often in books or in talks, like the falling of a protein, right? And they tell you that you know this is a funnel picture where where you get more and more data contact being formed, and you go from the unfolded state into the native state, and you have these beautiful pictures being drawn. Well, if you think about the protein from a microscopic viewpoint, a holistic viewpoint, it's not clear at all what is this axis here that has been being drawn. I mean, on which landscape is it? What's the reduction that you need to do to get to? Right? Like any of this, as you say, I mean, maybe it's down the number of native contacts being made or things like that, but that is all very speculative. So it's not a really clear audience. In fact, I mean, you don't need to go into examples that are as complicated as this to understand what's going on. Here, here are a few which are low dimensional and still have the same problem, which is here is one, uh, well, which is typical of what you would expect from a molecular system, is that the energy landscape is rough. What do we mean by rough energy landscape? That means that if you look at the bias that you have on the potential, they involve many, many different states. Okay, like this. So what, what, you, what you should think about is that uh, maybe the barrier between these two regions here is several kT. So that means that the system will be confined either in this region or in this region, and we have real reacting events between the two. But there is many, many little regions on the landscape that corresponds to other many local minima on the landscape that are connected by barriers that could be much less than kT. Imagine that kT is actually on that scale. Right. So in, in this case, you have metastability, but you can't really associate metastability with minima of the potential. Which one would you pick? Right. There's many, many local minima of the potential, and even global minima might not tell you that much, because you could have a, a global minima which is in a basin which is very narrow, and they would be not, you know, it would be not very, very important. So how do you describe metastability of a system like that? 
there, there are other systems that are even worse. Uh, okay, so you probably have seen that. It's another version. This is just uh, imagine that you have a box in which you have a Brownian particle, so there's no potential, except that there are walls. And so the, 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 you know, the guy, the walker is actually going around here, and he needs to find his way through this wall into going <coughs> over there. Okay? This is a system that is claiming the stability. For a long time, you, the, the, the walker will either be here or it will be there. Not so often go through. It's, it's like uh, a fly in this room that needs to go through a keyhole to go into the other room. Right? Uh, okay, so, so okay, but, but this is another version which is the same, but just a bit more complicated. It's a maze where you can imagine that there is an entrance to the maze that could be you know, connected to a very large cavity, right? and then there's an exit that would connected to another large cavity. If these cavities are large enough, this is where the system will spend most of its time. But from time to time, it will have to go from one, it can go from one cavity to the other. And in order to do so, it has to go through the maze. Okay. Again, if you look at the maze, there is no energy. It's pure entropy. It's just volume effects. The, the, the rare event is that you need to find the entrance of the maze, and then you need to find your way through the maze. Okay. And the way through the maze, so finding the, the entrance might already be a rare event. Finding the way through the maze is even more complicated because it's full of dead ends, traps, things like that, which you can't identify if you look at the energy. Because the energy in this system would be zero or flat everywhere and infinity at the wall. Okay. And there is another thing which uh, uh, is useful with this little example, which is that. You have been staring for a while to this uh, movie. The movie that you have trajectory of the particle going through the maze. Okay. And it's also telling you something else, which is what, what big emphasis of what I'm going to try to put, which is that when you do molecular dynamics, you need probabilistic tools and statistical tools to interpret your data. Because it's illusion. sometimes there is this, uh, this uh, illusion that goes around that says, well, I can't understand where it has I can't simulate them because they are too long. But if I could simulate them, then I would understand what's going on. Of course, then I would just look at them and understand. Right? These examples are showing you that this is a naive thing to think. Because this is an example which is actually quite simple, where you can stare at this guy going through the maze, and you can stare for a long time and not find out what exactly the path you should take in this case. It's just that the process from the people of the different can be quite complicated. Okay, so with all of these preliminaries, right, the way, uh, if we were to live in a perfect world and we could do whatever we want, right, the way you really would like to understand metastability, metastability is through spectral analysis. And so I'll go through that because it will give us this kind of foundation of what we need to then do approximation and understand things at the level. So, Spectral analysis involves two components. The first one is that you want to have a probabilistic description. That's what I wrote last, in fact. Is that if you have an overdamped equation, or in fact any uh, equation that describes your molecular dynamics, right, this defines a mark of process. Okay. And so you can go from the description that involves just the trajectory to a probabilistic description where instead of looking at trajectory of one individual guy, you would look at more probabilities are evolving in the system. It is like looking at poker card equations. Okay. Because everybody has a vague idea of how you, what is the poker card equation associated with an overdamped equation. I'll write it down here and then. So when you have to start with an equation which is like this, let me make it slightly more general than the one that I wrote. So if you look at this equation, where beta is again the inverse temperature and this is a diffusion coefficient. You must have seen this before. So this is diffusion coefficient. So if you look at this equation, right, uh, this is telling you how one trajectory is evolving in the system. Okay. But you can introduce a, a probability density. So you can introduce 
write it like that. This object, but if you wish, is you take a Dirac delta function along the trajectory that you feel at x, and then you average it. So it's the probability density function, right, to find the trajectory at point x at time t, given that it starts from x zero. Everybody see what that so this if, if you have just a Brownian particle, right, it, it would satisfy uh, a diffusion equation and it would just be a Gaussian that starts to spread. To start right, if I start the Brownian particle here, one particle would make a complicated random work in this uh, room. But if I look at the bit of them and I average over them all, I, I would get this probability uh, density. And what you would see is that it starts with a delta pt, and then it's just it's a Gaussian that broadens until you start feeling the, the walls of the room. Okay. And more generally, but that would be without this potential. If you have the potential, then you can write down an equation for this, which is a Fokker function, which is a diffusion equation. So it's, it's called, depending on the field you're in, and it's just like this I'll, I'll use as a short answer. Okay, so it, it's called Fokker point equation or Kolmogorov equation. You remember what this guy is, right? He was uh, this. So if you look, at, we have a goal here. So if you look at p, which is really p x zero t, if you put all of the, which is you take the delta function of the trajectory that you spin at the point x, and then you average. Right? This guy satisfies this equation, so which is called Fokker point equation. I think by most physicists, it's also called Shmulishovsky. It's also called the forward equation by mathematicians. So it has many names, but they are all. So the equation is like this. It's uh, and then you have D. Okay, it's a. So this is the force. These gradients, and so it's, it's, a P, it's a partial differential equation that tells you all uh, the equation, the, the, the probability density of all. Okay. Uh, it's sometimes written in different ways because you can say, you can also write it. Okay, sorry, let me not. This is just if, um, if the potential was not there, right, this would just reduce to D Laplace in P, which is just a diffusion equation, which is diffusion coefficient that you have Gaussian solution. If the potential is there, then in fact it has another you know, solution typically is not there. Right? What you know is that this P, if you look at P, no matter what is the initial condition, if you if you let T go to infinity, if you look at long time, it will go into uh, the Boltzmann distribution, which is this one, where C is just a normalization factor. And that you can check if you look at stationary solution of this equation, right? Uh, this factor here is zero if you replace p by this function. Yes? What's the symbol after this? This p? That's the, this is the V is the potential. It's the same as this guy. Okay? So you can go back and forth between these two descriptions. This is the same as that. Right? In other words, this gives you the probabilistic interpretation of what's going on here. Okay? So once you have once you have done that, um, then you, you can do something which is uh, quite interesting, which is that you can try to identify metastability by uh, looking essentially into the spectrum of the operator that you see here. So, there's, I mean, if you, so, I suppose you all have had a diagram in, uh, in, in algebra. Right? So, if you have a, one 
we internalize a matrix is just with the perspective of the total stadium value of the vector. Okay. And this is the equivalent if you look at the differential operator. Differential operator, right, are more complicated than matrices, but, but they also have a spectrum that corresponds to solving the similar equation. I'll write it on the, on the next slide. In fact, later in the talk and maybe tomorrow during the, the, um, uh, the workshop, maybe I will actually, if, if it's useful for you, I'll show you how this can be done really with matrices because uh, if you discretize this equation, if you, for instance, use finite elements or finite differences to, to discretize all of the derivatives, what you get is just a big matrix operation here. Right? Because you transform P, which is a function into a vector, and then this all becomes a multiplication by matrices. Later in the talk, I'll give you another description, which is probably more familiar to you, uh, in the context of Markov chain, Markov jump processes. Okay. So if you analyze, so this, the, uh, the next few slides will explain what's going on with this. If you analyze the spectrum of this operator, it actually tells you everything about what's going on in the process, and it allows you to identify how many metastable states do you have, and what are the mechanisms of the reaction between these metastable states. So I'll do that first by writing a few formula, and then I'll illustrate it on one example. Okay. So the formula are this, and don't be scared. It's, uh, it's, it's just much of the same as it was there. So this is the equation again. Right. I have written it slightly differently because I have uh, written it in a way so the equation which is there should really be written like this. Rewrite this equation. KTT, era. Right? And then you have n to n relation that connects the friction coefficient to the temperature and the diffusion coefficient. Because in fact, n to n relation is just a gamma is equal to that. Right? N to n relation. And, and, and therefore, simplicity, I have just said gamma is which is the same as saying D is equal to beta minus one. Right, one over beta. Okay. So the focal point operator associated with that, which is the generator, is the adjoint of the operator that you see in this equation. It can be written like this. Right, so it's an operator that involves a, a, a gradient, which is there, and a Laplacian, which is there. Right, so this takes the first derivative. If you wish, this takes the second derivative. This account for thermal effect, this account for the drift. It's an operator. You can think about that really as a multiplication by a matrix if that's more familiar to you. So as you know, uh, the, the, if you have a matrix, the, the spectrum of the matrix or its transport is identical. It's related to the same again value. So I, I just wrote this one uh, because this is the one that is always this is the one, so this, this is involved, this evolved probability, this is evolved observable. And that's the one that has the nice property for what I will get. So the, the eigen, so the eigenvalues will be the same, the eigen vectors are slightly different, but they can be correct or another, and these are the ones that I want to have. Okay, so if you do spectral analysis, what you do is you analyze, you solve this equation. The, the operator times the function needs to be minus lambda. It's a way to diagonalize this operator. The same way you have to do diagonalize the matrix. And so, and I can, we can discuss this more if you want in, in next class. In this specific case for this equation, there's a few results that, that are known. In particular, it is known that all of the eigenvalues of these operators are positive, which I write it like that. So it's, it's, really, these are the eigenvalues of minus L. I put the minus L. So all the eigenvalues are positive, and so you can order them like this, and the first one is zero. Okay. And it tells you this, it tells you that just in the same way, as when you do, when you have a matrix, you can do a spectral decomposition of the matrix if you have done eigenvalues in the first of the matrix. You can do a spectral decomposition of this probability density function, and here is the spectral decomposition. 
it says that, so essentially what does it say? It says that um, you can decompose the evolution of the probability right, into the superposition of evolution of A and mode, which are the eigen functions, which are the parts. Okay. And each of them decays on a time scale which is the inverse of the eigen the associated eigen value. Does this, does this make sense, more or less? I mean, we can go into more detail of this formula later. If you want, I'll do them again in the context of the Markov chain, which is simpler in the middle. So this is great, actually. Why is this great? It's great because this is one way you can define metastability. What metastability would mean? Right? Metastability should mean that if, if you have this double well, what, what should happen is that if you look at the trajectory, uh, on short time scale they should quickly go into one well or the other. And then on long time scale they make this hopping between one well or the other. Okay. At the level of the PDF, the P, what this would mean is that if you start all the particles in one well, but you make many of them, right, they will all pretty much go into together into the bottom of one well where they will collapse. And then there will be a slow leaping of probability from one well to another. Okay. This should be contained in this. So how is that contained in that? Well, it's contained in the following way. If, the, if you have a group of eigenvalues which is much smaller than the rest, okay. so if you, this is what I mean here, you could imagine that there's only one that is like that. Right? Which, but here there's k of them that are small. So there's this one is zero, right? there's all of these guys, and here there is a gap. Right? For instance, this is one, two, three, four, five, and then that one goes to 10,000. Okay. So if this is happening, you need to remember that these are like frequencies, they are inverse of time. This is saying that everything that is associated with these eigenvalues here is fast. I think that are going on fast on the time scale associated with these eigenvalues. In particular, you can fix time scale, you can pick a clock in which you take times that are such that if you look at lambda k minus 1 or any one of those, if you wish, times that time, this is of order 1 or less. But because this guy is much bigger than this guy, if this is true, then this will be. And you remember that in the decomposition, well, the factor that enters, maybe I can write the decomposition there. I raise that because you remember that. Okay. The decomposition says that the tx0 tx is equal to the sum of these eigenvalues, so the index of the eigenvalues, of e to the minus lambda k t. And then you have the eigenfunction, which is phi k zero phi k at x and then this uh, row equilibrium x which is in this case it's just that row equilibrium okay so so if you look at this right you see that if I let t go to infinity very very long time everything decays the only thing that do not decay is the lambda zero because lambda zero is zero There is a result that you know is that the phi zero of x is one. You can also prove that easily. So that means that the only thing that remains is this guy. In this big sum, the only one term should, you know, uh, survives at t for infinity, and that's the equivalence you just said. Everything eventually needs to be equal to equivalent. But if you have this, okay, and you take this times here, right? Even though the original sum is from zero to infinity. Take all the eigenvalues into account, right? If you take a time which is such, so if you take a time which is such that you have a thesis of all the one, then all the rest will have decay. So you can effectively forget about this and replace it by k. Right here? For example, if you have a double well and you take the temperature to zero, okay, what you would see is that 
there is only two eigenvalues that are small. They correspond to lambda zero, which is zero, and then one more, which is the eigenvalue associated with the time scale of the relaxation between these two wells. Okay, that's all they would be. If there's three wells, you would get three eigenvalues and so on and so forth. Okay. The advantage of this description, however, is that it doesn't need the, the reason why these eigenvalues need to be small doesn't have to be associated with the simple picture of a double or triple well potential in which you point temperature to zero. If you go back to these examples, and maybe we can play with that a little bit, if you take this barrier here between these two regions sufficiently high compared to Kt, but these regions of order Kt, in this example, only get two small eigenvalues because there is only beta stability over two states. Okay? But this is not associated with minima. If you look at the minima of the potential here, there is much more minima than two. Many more. Same thing here. In this example, if you were to solve the equation, which is just solving this equation without that with this appropriate boundary condition to account for the walls, you would get that there is only two the whole there is small enough, there would be two small eigenvalues. And that's it. Okay? This case is a little bit more complicated, and we will discuss it later. Okay. So that's the idea. So here let me show you uh, an example on how these eigenvalues look on a specific example, which actually is not completely trivial even though it's tricky. Okay? It's a phase potential. Call it this way. So there is a so it's a potential. I'm going to tell you know what are the features of the potential and, and what are the little things that makes it actually quite complicated and though it's tricky. Very briefly. So it has four minima. They are there. Um, these two minima are the deepest one. So that means that this is where the equivalent probability is most. These two minima are slightly higher in energy. Okay, so the system doesn't tend to spend much time there, but if it ever goes there, it stays trapped. In other words, these are dynamical traps for a reaction that would involve these two guys. There are one, two, three saddle points in this system. And you will see them on the, on the further graph. There is minimum energy path that connects things this way. So the way the reaction, because we're going to talk about that later, but if you look at the reaction that would go from this state to this state, the way it's actually made complicated is by two phenomena. The first one is that there is an intermediate. When the system goes from there to there, it stays trapped in the middle <coughs> over there. Okay. There is not a time scale associated with that. And then there's something even more nasty that is happening. It's not that nasty, but it is. Which is that once the system is there, in fact, the, the barrier to go between these two minima is lower than the barrier to escape this minimum and either go there or back there. Which means that not only is there a trap here, but this trap is connected to another trap. And the system has a tendency to go between these two traps many, many times before it gets out of the trap and eventually finishes the reaction. Right. So later on in the talk, we need to explain this in simple terms. But what I want to show you here are simply the eigen uh, function. If you do a spectral analysis here, right, you get four small, four small eigenvalues. And that's because there's four minimum. I only put three of them because one is trivial. The first one corresponds to lambda zero equals zero and it's flat. The next three are actually non-trivial. And what you see in each of these pictures are contour plots of uh, the facts for index one, two, and three, zero and one. Okay. And you see that 
they very nicely separate all the possible wealth that's here in this system. And these guys need to be orthogonal to one another, meaning that if you take that's not really the property that you can prove easily, you can always orthogonalize them in such a way that if you take phi k x, phi l x, and then the rho equilibrium of x, and you integrate, you get delta k l. Meaning it's equal to 1 if k is equal to l, it's equal to 0 otherwise. Okay? So that means that they need to oscillate in such a way that they are out of, I mean, they don't oscillate for you, meaning, meaning that they, they need to be 0 or positive or negative over the space, in such a way that if you look at all of them, they need to compensate exactly so that this integral is 1 if you take k equal l and 0 to 1. So that's what you see here with these figures, for example. You can see this is very small and the true value of is 0 there. And so if you multiply these two functions together, in fact, they will be 0 everywhere. They will be 0 there. So in this system, if you understand it, right, if you do the spectral analysis, you get the time scale. I, don't, I have not listed the value of the eigenvalues, which is not very but they, the, these eigenvalues which give you all the time scale corresponding to the slow relaxation in the system. And you see that the eigenfunctions are actually identifying somehow what are the metastable sets. Okay? Let me make that a little bit more precise. If you look at this equation, you can write it in what uh, mathematicians call a conservation law. So a conservation law, a law is just a, a rule, I mean, like a, you know, an equation, if you wish. And conservation means that it conserves something. Well, it conserves probability. And so why, why is that a, a conservation rule? It's because if you write it like that, but you see that if I integrate this over all x, okay, then I integrate here a divergence, and so I can use Brooks' uh, theorem to actually tell me that this is just the integral of the boundary where there is nothing. In other words, this automatically indicates that um, the probability is conserved in the system. It's actually it's a local conservation. It says that if you pick any region, the probability that comes in needs to be the probability that comes out at any given time. You're conserving the probability in your system. You cannot lose. So you can think about that. I mean, it might be useful instead of talking about probability to really think about this as, as a flow, as an incompressible fluid, for example. In which what you have is that you just have water that is flowing around the room, right? And the total amount of water needs remain the same. That's also useful, this idea of water, because um, so what you see at the right hand side here is called the current. Okay? It says that you know the way mass or probability is transported is by the divergence of the current, which is exactly like the fluid. Right? And the current, which has this expression, is what's inside here. Right? It's minus the, the minus is subject here, you can, because you have a decomposition for P, a spectral decomposition for P, you also have a spectral decomposition for the current. It's written there. You can write the current like this. I'll go back into this formula in a minute in a, in a simpler context. Okay. Where you can think about, just in the same way as the way the probability is decaying, right, is by the probability is decaying by looking at all of these modes. The current is also reaching its stationary value, which is the stationary value of the current, by having different modes for it. Does that make sense? In particular, you notice that if you look at the expression here, right, uh, if k is equal to 0, phi is equal to 1, so this gradient is equal to 0. So in this sum, I could have forgotten the k equals 0. That means that there is no, so the current associated with the zero eigenvalue, which is the equilibrium distribution, is zero. There is no, at equilibrium, there is no more current in the system. That's because it's a system which is an equilibrium system. Right? But before you go to equilibrium, there are currents that need to go through the system. Okay? And that's what this guy described. 
This is a vector field. Right? Because at every point x, you get the gradient of a function, so it gives you a little arrow. In fact, uh, I, I thought that the resolution of the, the... Let me show them to you a bit better by editing this, maybe. Uh, or maybe I can... Wait, hold on. Okay, so I, I want to grow... So this is one eigen function. And what you see below here is the associated current. So I'll, I'll just make the picture bigger so that you see what's going on because... I. Make it sufficiently big, you'll start seeing these little arrows. The resolution is poor, so I, somehow I can't. But you should see that there are arrows that actually go this way. In fact, you can you can read what these arrows should do simply because the, the, the arrow needs to be uh, always perpendicular to the level set, to the isoline of it. Right? Uh, so it's, the, it's the gradient. Of The gradient, the gradient of phi, where is it? Is the gradient of phi that involves this curve? It's just the gradient of phi weighted by the equivalent distribution, right? And so you see, uh, oops, the gradient goes like that, right? And it, and it's maximal here, somewhere here, because of the weight by the equivalent distribution. Okay. So this vector tells you everything, in a way, because if you look at this current, it's actually telling you all probabilities flowing in this system for the slowest mode associated with the relaxation time in the, in the problem. Uh, this is more of the same, where, okay, so if, if you have, yes. <coughs> function. So they are, if, if you call this operator L, it's L sky, it's L phi plus minus lambda phi. They are negative vector size. Okay? So here is more of the same, and, and there's something quite important you need to be explained. So, so this is the Eigen function. This is the vector field associated with it. And if you have a vector field, you can define its flow lines. Okay? These are the flow lines. They tell you all the probabilities flowing as far as this slow mode is concerned. Okay. This, by the way, that you don't see, do you see that there's a red blob here? Can we uh, turn the one light off just for a sec? <laughs> right, there is a red blob. <laughs> See? That's a trajectory. That's a reactive trajectory. I'll tell you what the reactive trajectory is in a minute. But the reactive trajectory is a trajectory where I looked at what happened when the system go from this state to this state. And you see that it travels really and then it completely just traps into these two um, these two dynamical traps. Right? But if you look at this, it's much more simple. You have not understood what's going on because you see what is the probability curve. Okay. okay, I need to make a few remarks about this before we go on, which are very important, which is that um, I have said that the, these, these rare events are associated with slow processes in the system. That's true, but it's only true because I look at the probability. The probability right, is evolving slowly. But if I were to look at the individual trajectory, there is nothing slow in the individual trajectory. Okay, this is very important. But let me explain to you a bit more with double well what will happen. You are saying that uh, the vector time in the world is much larger than yeah, the faster. Uh, so in this, let's discuss, let's discuss a simple example first, and then uh, we can speak to illustrate that. You should imagine, so I don't know whether I can really, probably I can resolve that to explain why. 
because this, this, I think this is important. It's important to, if you want to understand what is the, the, you know, the, the kind of description that you want to have. Suppose you have a double red line here. If I look at one trajectory, what it will do is if I start it here, and, and I have a KVT which is much smaller than the bias, this guy will go down here and then it will over here. And then what's going to happen? From time to time, there will be a fluctuation which will push it up the hill, and it will not go very far because the fluctuation will be not high enough to push it all the way there, and then it will come down. Okay? And after many, many failed attempts, there will be one that pushes it over here, and then the process will repeat. When this fluctuation occurs, the path that the process takes is very fast. Okay? The reason why you have a small time scale is because there were many, many failed attempts all the way above the bias. Okay. So if you look at the trajectory, what you would see, now if I were to look at the trajectory, this is x. <coughs> if I were to look at uh, as a function of time at x, what I would see is that if this is one minimum and this is the other, and if this is say uh, minus one and one, like we have in the grid system, minus one and one, but what I would see is that it's hovering here for a very long time. In fact, Making spikes. It came from time to time, ago, but most of the time it spends it here, okay? and then poof, it goes there and does that. And, uh, and this is the picture that was on my first time. Right? And this is very fast. But if you look at the probability, though, the probability is leaking slowly. Because if you think about the probability, what you should imagine is that you don't have one guy like that. You have put 10 billion of them in the world, and they are all independent. Okay? And then the leaking of the probability is because continuously there is one that managed to do that. Okay? It's very slow because so it, it goes, but they will eventually, and on the time scale, which is given by the corresponding random value. So we have identified slow process because of logistic description, but there is nothing slow that you would see. It's not true that the rare event corresponds to this guy climbing up here very slowly. In fact, you know that that's true. Because this is, these processes are time reversible. You can, if I give you a movie of this, right, you can tell if I have switched the time or not. The movie looks exactly the same if you, if you, if you play this way or if you play forward or backward. Okay? So that has an important consequence here. Because it tells you that the way up needs to be the same as the way down in reverse. If you think about the process going down from there, you, nobody would tell me, oh, it's actually going down very, very slowly here, like it's all break off. Right? It will go down, whatever, it will be a speed to go down. Take that piece of trajectory, look at it backward in time, it tells you how it will go up. Okay? So they are fast up, fast down. But if you look at that level, it's actually quite slow. What am I doing this time? So, okay, so then maybe I'll simply pose a question and continue that on the next class, which is, um, okay, so, so if, if we want to recap, and I'll do more of this because I realize that probably you're not very familiar with the spectral of decomposition. So that's why I'll do more of that in the next class. I'll re explain that in another context. And then in any, in any case, we will have to do approximation of this because you can't solve this problem in high dimensions. Right? It just gives you a framework to think about the problem, but not a practical one at this point. We have to make it practical. But, but the key is really we have made this probabilistic description that tells you what the stability <coughs> is. And now that I've done that, I want to, and that's for the next class, I want to tell you, well, in fact, it's very nice, but besides having practical considerations, might be that this picture is too complete, that you would like to keep it in mind to build something else that is a bit more tailored. That's why let me explain that. If you look at this example, already this example, you might be interested in the reaction from that guy to that guy. And so that means that you want to have this eigen, this eigen function that gives you this curve. 
when you do the spectral analysis, you don't know which one in the stack this will be. Because there's many other slow processes in the, in the problem. It could be, this is not the case C, turns out that in this case, this is the slowest process, but it could be that processes associated with hopping between these two are even slower than the process between these two. Okay. So that would mean that you would have to analyze the whole spectrum of this operator and start looking at what are the again values to understand what's going on. This is unfeasible in, in complicated systems. Okay. You know, even, here's an example that will illustrate that. If, if you look at this little potential, right, the, the slowest time scale in this problem involved going out of this trap. But this is something that really happens once every blue moon because this trap is extremely unlikely and the barrier to get there is huge. The reaction that you might be interested in the lab to understand is the reaction within these two tracks that involve hopping over this barrier. This is not the slowest time scale in the system. So if you think about high dimensional system, you could imagine that there are zillions of these and then buried after all of these guys that are irrelevant, there is one that you would like to analyze. Okay. So what we're going to do in the next slide, we're going to keep in mind all of this framework, but we're going to try to pair it in such a way that I want, what I want to do is I want to find a tool which allows me to zoom directly on this, react, this reaction of interest and compute essentially these flow lines directly without having to consider all of the other processes just by saying, okay, I know that I'm interested between the reaction between these two things. Okay? So we'll do that, and then we'll see how we can do computation with this in, in actual reaction systems. Okay? And in doing so, we're going to do something else, which, by the way, is like, you, you see that the last thing I said. I, mean, I told you at the beginning, that um, the concept of reaction coordinates is different from the concept of a reaction path. A reaction coordinate is something that is supposed to tell you how the reaction is advancing. Okay? So this is something that you should be able to define everywhere in space. If the system is here, you should tell at this point how far is it along the reaction. Okay? Or there, or there, or there. A path is something which is different. A path is just a line, right, which, on which the system is never, I mean, because the probability in high dimension to be on a given path is actually zero. Okay? So the, even though these concepts in the, in the chemical physics research are often used in terms of changes, they are quite different, and if you start thinking about it, it's not completely obvious how you relate one to the other. How do you get a path from a reaction coordinate, or how do you get a reaction coordinate for the path? Right? This is already telling you that there is a chance to actually link the two concepts because this is a reaction coordinate if you want. This is the phi here. It's a function defined everywhere that I can use to monitor the advancement of the reaction between this state and this state. We'll use another one in a minute, but you could use this one. Okay? And out of this phi, out of this reaction coordinate, I can construct flow lines. Which are there. Okay? And then I can wait these flow lines, by, so a flow line is like a collection of reaction paths. Okay? And among them, I can weight them. This is actually the coloring that, you, that is there. Well, it's a coloring that is telling you where most of the current arrives. So again, this is the part of the river that is flowing fast, which is where there's a lot of water coming through. You see that it is concentrated on one channel here. So among, not all of these paths there are equivalent. Some of them carry more current than others. Okay. So if you start thinking about this, it's actually telling you, well, okay, this is a way to formalize reaction coordinate. And this is a way, since they, these figures are obtained by calculation through this reaction coordinate, to actually get that. That explains to you what is the mechanism of reaction. The center is the part that goes through the center of the tube where most of the reaction occurs. Okay. In the next class, we'll make that more precise <coughs> by revisiting.